Okay, so let's have a quick look here. We're gonna the our goal is to know why it's a good idea at the end of this to own a Subaru or other safe car. Subaru is a really safe car. That's my objective. I'm supposed to state my objective, and that's it. Do you own a Subaru? We do own a Subaru. My wife drives it. Yeah. Market venture. How many make it? How much did Candy write? Yeah. How much did Candy? I I can't disclose that. I'm under. Well, he made a MacBook. I'm sure he gets some for that. Okay, so let's <laughs> let's see what's going on here. So let's look at our definition of force for a second. We're gonna kind of work backwards for a second, and then we'll turn around and work forward. So what what's what's force equal to in general? Mass times acceleration. Mass times acceleration. Good. What's our definition of acceleration? V O D V D T, right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll call it delta V over, oops, that vector sign. Delta V over delta T, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I could do something to both sides of this equation that are kind of interesting. I could multiply both sides by delta T. I would get, if I did that, I would get the equation F delta T equals M delta V. Okay? That's such an important relationship that we're even going to, we're going to take a little different approach to this. From our perspective, mass is constant, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Mass doesn't change. Okay? We'll have to revise that thought here by the end of the day. But oh, no. for now we'll say, yeah, it doesn't change. Now let's let's think about this for a second from a calculus perspective. If I wrote this in a, in terms of calculus, I would say that force equals M D V dt, because that's our calculus definition of instantaneous acceleration, right? Um, okay, dv dt, the slope of a velocity time graph is acceleration. And in our class, we always treat the functions as being straight lines, right? Constant acceleration. But in real world, the real world, they're not. In calculus, we deal with lots of functions that aren't straight lines. And we now know how to use techniques of calculus to find derivatives, right? We have yes. all our rules for taking derivatives, so we can do stuff like that. Okay, mass is a constant, though, right? And so really, in calculus, this would be the same thing. M dv dt would be the same thing as saying the derivative with respect to t of m v. Because what do we do when we multiply, or we, when we differentiate a function that has a constant? Well, then go away, but what do we do with the constant? Keep it, keep it. Keep it out front, right? We pull it out front. Keep it. Like the derivative of 3x squared would be 3 times the derivative of x squared, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it might be convenient for us to name this quantity then, right? And we can't. This is a quantity that we know in physics is momentum. Okay, so momentum. We call it P, lowercase p, and it's just the product of mass and velocity. It's a vector quantity. It inherits its vector nature from velocity. So whatever direction is associated with our velocity vector, that is also associated with our momentum vector. Okay? Make sense? Yeah. And so from a calculus perspective at least, well, I mean, really, not even just from a calculus perspective. What this tells us is that a better definition of force, even though we'll stick with MA in classical physics, and you'll see why, but a more accurate definition of force is the rate of change, whoops, the rate of change of momentum. And because mass is constant, that just becomes M times delta V, delta T, which is MA, right? Be with me, okay. But momentum is important, okay. So if we think about momentum as being m 
delta V, then we know that delta P is really just M delta V, right? Because M is a constant. And we could change this to read, let's flip it around too. Delta P is equal to F delta T, and we give that a name. Either side of that equation is what we call impulse in physics. By definition, impulse is just, the, is just a change in momentum. That is it. Okay. Why is this a big deal? Well, I want, you to, I want you to think about a situation here. Let's say you're driving in a car. If you're driving in a car and you're driving at highway speeds, so let's say you're driving, let's say you're going pretty fast. You're going 40 meters a second. Okay. So that's fast. If you're going 40 meters a second or even, say, 35 meters a second, so that's more realistic. 35 meters a second, and you come to a stop, you can do that in a bunch of different ways. We could slowly decelerate over a period of, let's say, 15 seconds. Okay. 35, now let's, let's, let's put some numbers to this. So we're looking at, at impulse here, right? Impulse. capital I equals delta P, okay? which is the same thing as M delta V, right? So mass stays the same. Let's say, let's look at this from the perspective of, how about you? Let's say we're going to take a, a adult male, big adult male with a, to make the numbers easy, has a mass of 100 kilograms, so about 220 pounds. So it's not a big Oh, yeah, that is. Okay, big person. So if we're going to go from 35 meters per second, right, that means from 35 meters per second to zero. As pressure softball players that need a ride to Mackay Park, your bus is waiting in the student parking lot. JV and freshman softball players, your bus is waiting in the student parking lot. So the magnitude of that impulse is negative 3,500 kilogram meters per second. Okay. If that happens over a period of, let's say, okay, that's it, right? Okay, we also know impulse is equal to F delta T. Let's say we want to solve this for F, right? So F is equal then to delta P over delta T, okay? That's going to give us negative 3,500 standard units divided by delta T. If this happens over a period of 35 seconds, we're going to get an average force of 100 newtons. Everybody agree? Yeah. Okay, if I just plug in 35 for delta T, okay, how much is 35 newtons? 35 newtons is about, mm, what is that? 35 newtons is going to be about mm, 8 point something pounds. That's how much force is acting against the person to slow them down. Not a big deal, right? That's easily absorbed by the cushion on your seat, right? You don't have to, you don't have to brace yourself for anything. 35 pounds is no big deal, right? What if this happens over a tenth of a second? If it happens over a tenth of a second, that changes things, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, if it happens over the period of a tenth of a second, all of a sudden, now you're talking about 35,000 newtons. And 35,000 newtons is equivalent to about, you know, roughly, let's just say, 8,800 pounds. Yeah, that's a lot. 
right? 8,800 pounds is heavier than a car, right? Many cars, right? So that's a big force. That's not probably going to be a good situation, especially when that force, if it's not distributed uniformly over your body, I mean, that's bad. People, that's why people die in car crashes, right? Because it happens suddenly, right? That's the thing about a car crash. It's not, it's not the change in momentum. It's the time over which that change in momentum happens, right? Because if you look at the impulse momentum equation, or the impulse equation, your change in momentum equals F delta T, if you're driving along at 35 meters per second and you get into a crash, it's not negotiable, really, what your change in momentum is going to be. That's outside of your control, right? If you hit something that's not going to move, then you're going to come to rest, right? That's... You have no control over that. But what is it that you do potentially have some control over that you want to try to you want to try to control as much as you can? The type of car you drive. Okay. The time. <laughs> the time. It's the time is the important thing. You want to spread the collision out as much in time as you can. Because if you can prolong the time of the collision, the force goes down. Because the product of these two things, the impulse, is outside of your control, right? The product of force times time interval is fixed, but because it's a product of those two things, they have, and it's constant, they have to be inversely related. As one goes up, the other must go down because the product remains constant, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? So if we could extend the time interval of that collision from a tenth of a second to maybe half a second, you know, half a second makes this a lot better. Half a second makes this, uh, what's that make this? Uh, 7,000 newtons, which is, now you're talking about, you know, I mean, less than, maybe less than 2,000 pounds of force spread over your body. That might be survivable, right? So that's the goal, is you got to make this thing last long. How do you do that? Okay, one thing you do is you make the engine drop out. Yeah, and so if you look at cars that are well designed, which would mean typically, unfortunately, either expensive cars or Subarus, uh, then one thing they do is that they shunt the engine underneath the car. So in an accident, it's designed to break free of the chassis and slide under the car. That's good. Okay. Uh, what else do they do? Make it out of flexible uh, metal. Okay, they make they make it in two pieces. Yeah, they make. They make an interior safety cage, which is made of very hard steel, hardened steel, that is going to protect you from being punctured. That's the idea, right? Hard steel, so things can't get to your body that are that are going to magnify the force by creating. Well, not, they're going to they're going to create. We haven't talked about this yet. They're going to create high pressures. Pressure is force per unit area, and if you get experience too high pressure, it punctures you. And so you don't want to be punctured. So you want, it, you want to be able to not have sharp things hit you, hardened safety cage. But the other part of the car, they want to make the opposite. The other part of the car, they want to make somewhat flexible. They want it to crumple on impact. And so there's kind of this old, and you've probably heard people say this, maybe your parents have even said this, you know, if we want to get our kid a big old car because big old cars are safer because after a collision, they look the same as before the collision. Not true. That's not a good thing. If you get in a car in a big old Cadillac, sure, the Cadillac looks identical after the collision to what it was like before the collision, but that means that it didn't crumple. And so you still stopped in a relatively short period of time, a very short period of time, right? What you'd rather have happen is the car look horrible after the accident because it's crumpled up like an accordion. And so modern cars are built in a way so that they actually build failure points into the car so that when it crumples, it crumples like an accordion. Certain pieces bend away from the car and certain pieces bend in, and it, it, it crumples down from its full extent of the hood. It crumples down to, you know, when you're done at a relatively high-speed collision, the front of the car would only be a few feet from where you're sitting, right? But what happened during that time interval? Well, it got extended, right? It takes a while for the car to crumple, and so it reduces the, the time of the impact, thereby decreasing the force levels, hopefully the sub-lethal lethal force levels. Okay, so that's what people do to the structure of the car. What can you do inside the safety cage where you're sitting? 
Okay, seat belts really don't help that much. I mean, their seat belts help because they keep you in the car. That's their purpose, and they do that well. But seat belts, in some ways, are even. They, they, they can almost make things, if you only had a seat belt, yeah, it keeps you in the car, but in another way, it's it's pretty tough on your body because there's not a lot of area exposed to the seat belt, so the pressures get really high. So if you have a lap belt on only, you never want to have just a lap belt on, that pressure is so high around your waist that a lot of times people that get in car accidents that have only lap belts end up being paraplegics because it breaks their back where the seat belt pushed on their diaphragm. I barely right? said one person got cut in half. And, when I was little. Right, and that and that could happen too, right? Because it's such a it's such a small, it's high pressure, right? So I don't want to. I mean, seat belts are hugely important because if you get thrown from a car, your odds of dying go up dramatically. So you got to have a seat belt on. But there's something else that's important. Airbag. Airbags. Yeah. The whole people. point of an airbag is to do what? Protect you. No. Protect you. Cushion. <laughs> Protect you. How, okay, it cushions you, but cushioning, that's kind of a that's kind of a non physics type word. What do we mean when we, what do cushions reduce really do? Reduce impact. They, they, okay, they reduce impact, but how do they do it? What do, what do cushions, what are they really designed to do? When you cushion something, Increase the time. you're increasing the time of the collision, right? Because it takes a while to compress the cushion. That's the whole point. That's why cushions are nice. But they come out so fast. They come out pretty fast, but they, and, and they're, it wouldn't be fun Nothing about being in a collision is going to be very fun for you, but the reason airbags have to come out fast, why is that? That's correct. That's what they should do. Break your nose. They might. They might break your nose, but they'll save your life. They, they want to extend rapidly so that they can maximize, that, that they can deflate over a longer period of time. That's a good way to think about it. Right? If the airbags didn't explosively deploy, they wouldn't deploy until you had already moved forward significantly, and then you wouldn't have slowed down, right? And so that gives you less time to slow down. It actually, you see what I'm saying? You want, to, you want to multiply the time of that force as much as you can. So you want the airbag to start stopping you as quickly as possible, so they explosively deploy, so that gives them more time to act. Does that make sense? Yes? If you get hit by an airbag, but you're not going to crash, it's bad enough. Well, okay, it's not it's not good, but it's not for kids. It, there are some cases where with small children that it's been lethal. I think it's I, I don't know the statistics, but I think it's extremely rare, extremely rare, for an airbag to to kill an adult. Uh, I just um, last year on the news there was something about a bunch of recalls for cars and like the airbag thing, and there's police officers. Well, okay, that's that's possible, and there I know there was recently a recall where there were some parts, some loose parts that had shaken loose and gotten into the airbag, and so they were became shrapnel, and that was a bad thing. But they but they recalled. There's a huge recall, and they fixed it. You can't statistically. One thing I can tell you is, airbags are much much safer than not having airbags. You definitely want to have an airbag. Airbags are a very very good thing. Uh, it's you know, and it's. You know, I'm a parent of a teenager, and so my daughter will have airbags. <laughs> Teenagers are put in worse situations in terms of the possibility of getting in an accident. Statistically, teenagers get in far more accidents than adults do. The highest, uh, highest, or the highest cause of death for people who are 15 and 25 is accident. Or yeah. Not car accident, but just accidents in general. Accidents. But of that <laughs> subclass, car accidents are by far the biggest, yeah. Single biggest identifiable cause of death for teenagers is, without a doubt, by far, car accidents. So that's the thing that you'd want to probably, if you're going to put your time and energy into trying to, you know, do one thing that's going to make your odds of not dying much, much higher, that's it. You know, it's probably going to be in a car crash if it happens. Do uh, side airbags? What's that? Side airbags, do they help? They definitely help, yeah. Airbags, it's side airbags, same principle. It, they're not as wide, and so, but usually the forces involved in a, in a side collision aren't as great, right? I mean, you're going fast in that direction, so relative to you, things are coming by you with a, with a high component of speed along your line of travel, right? Even if something's at rest, if you're going fast that way, from your perspective, it's going fast that way. 
things usually don't hit you from the side. They hit you mostly from the front, right? And so, yeah, the front airbags have to be better. Uh, but you want to have head restraints on your seats for if you get hit from behind. You want to have airbags in front, and preferably you want to have curtain air airbags on the side. But the big thing is headrests, good headrests, and airbags in the front. Those are the two most important ones. Why don't they make seat belts where they, uh, like, instead of just immediately stopping you or whatever, like, somehow slow well, I, like slower I think stopping. they, I think they do give a little bit, but it's, but it's just not as good. The airbags are better. It couldn't be more like that too much. I, yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe. I would think maybe some cars do. I, I don't know that much about new seatbelt technology, but I do know that airbags are a lifesaver. And, and you'll notice, the question was asked last period, well, but do you want your car to be totaled? And I would say, yes, you do, for one obvious important reason, is you're gonna walk away. The other thing is, are you gonna wanna drive a car that's been in an accident? So you'd rather just get a new one. But here's the other thing, that what people tend to think is, okay, well, maybe my insurance rates go up then because the insurance doesn't wanna pay for a new car, wrong. It is much, much more expensive to pay to repair a human body than it is to buy a new car. You get a substantial discount on your insurance if you have a safe car. And the insurance companies know full well that because it's a safe car, it's gonna to get totaled pretty easily. If you get in an accident, it's likely to be totaled. But they say, that's okay. It's an expendable item. The insurance company spending 25 grand for a car is nothing compared to spending a million dollars paying hospital bills for somebody that's has to that's in intensive care. So to them it's just they won't it won't even bat an eye twice. It's hey, here's a new car. Enjoy it. You know, pick one out. Glad you had good insurance, you know, glad you had a nice car. It, it saved it saved them a boatload of money too. Okay, so definitely it's from everybody's perspective it's it's good to have a good car. Safe car, I should say. Um, so what do we take out of this? Okay, definition of momentum is what? P equals? MV. MV, okay, that's the definition of momentum. What's the true definition of force? F equals? M. Okay, M delta V over delta T. Delta P over delta T. Now that's, that's gonna, remember what happens, what happens for regular stuff is, delta P over delta T just becomes delta MV over delta T, and M is a constant, right? So that just equals MA, because delta V over delta T is A, right? Yeah. Okay, but that's for our scale of speeds and sizes and energies, right? That's not the way the world really works, though. The way the world really works is that F really is equal to dP dt from a calculus perspective. And so what we really do have to do is we really do have to differentiate with respect to time a product. And what is the product rule? M, V, D, V, D, T, which we could call V dot, right? Okay, plus V M dot. Okay. What's the dot? Dot means uh, derivative with respect to time. So that's the same thing as saying M, D, V, D, T, plus D, M, D, T, times V. So in non-calculus terms, in non-calculus terms, what that just looks like then is we could say that in reality, F equals M delta V over delta T, which is A, right? Plus delta M over delta T times V. But you might ask, why in the world do we include an M dot or a DM DT or a delta M or delta T? Why do we include, in other words, a rate of change of mass? I thought mass was constant, right? It's not. It's just constant for non-relativistic speeds. 
right? When you talk about relativistic speeds, where you start to approach the speed of light, it no longer remains constant. It changes. Three things happen that we will talk at more, in more length about later when you go close to the speed of light. Clocks run slow, which we already talked. Didn't we talk about Planet of the Apes yesterday? Yeah. Here, right? So everybody remembers that? So that's, that's an example of relativistic time dilation, right? And we said, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I gave you kind of a way to sort of conceptualize that. You move through space-time at a constant rate, so you're either moving through time exclusively if you're standing still, or you can move through a combination of time and space if you have some velocity. The faster you go, the greater portion of your movement through space-time that is eaten up by movement through space, leaving little left to move through time, right? So if you move very, very close to the speed of light, you would be moving almost exclusively through space and very, very slowly through time. Okay, and that's a, that's a, a good way to understand time dilation when moving clocks run slowly. Two other things happen. Lorentz contraction occurs, which means that space, including objects embedded in that space, gets shortened up along the direction of motion. And so what this means is that if you drove a 25-foot long Cadillac and you had this, this Cadillac going close to the speed of light, it would become much, much shorter from the perspective of somebody watching it move very rapidly towards you, okay, or kind of by you. In fact, you could even, with an extremely high-speed camera, take a picture of that Cadillac completely fitting inside a three-foot-long garage, and it would really fit in there for a split second at least, because its, it, its length really would contract along the direction of travel. It's a known, verifiable fact. The other thing that happens is mass increases, rel relativistic mass increases. And so that is why people, when people ask the question, what if you could go the speed of light, the answer is always you can't. Because as you approach the speed of light, what do you think happens to your mass? It becomes, it approaches infinity. And something with infinite mass can't be accelerated, right? And so what you in, in, in effect get is at really slow speeds. And let's think about, when I say slow speeds, when I'm talking about, relativistically speaking, if I'm talking about a high-speed bullet, that's, you know, it's so slow. So slow as to be not even appreciably moving relative to the speed of light. The speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. What is the closest thing we've come to the speed of light? Uh, with actual, well, okay, so, I don't know, I know at Stanford, for a long time, that held the record for the fastest particle. They, they use electrons, it's really light. And they could go 99.9999997% the speed of light. So that's really fast, but that's also got a very, very small mass. So that's it probably, or something, maybe now, probably CERN push, makes things go faster now, even though they're a little heavier. Or just big things. Like but like big things, things? yeah. Big things, it's not much. I mean, human, how fast can we go? What's that? Like humans, how fast can we go? Well, they're not very fast. I mean, humans can go, even in a plane, you look at the fastest jet planes, and the fastest jet planes go, what? I think the record is like Mach, well, I think the X-15, which is arguably not even a plane, went like, I don't know, 15,000 miles an hour or something. But that's, that's not very much. 15,000 miles an hour, I mean, that's, I don't know what that is in terms of miles per second, but it can't be more than one, you know, or, I mean, that's fast. A mile a second, that's pretty fast. Maybe it was two, I don't know. Something like that. But, I mean, so even if, you know, we could figure it out, but even if we did, I mean, compare that to 186,000 miles a second. It's, it's not even, you know, it's, it's tiny. And the thing is, when you, when you calculate relativistic effects, and this I will share with you, there's something called the gamma factor that always pops in to these calculations. The gamma ray? Kind of like the O'Reilly factor. The O'Reilly, what's the O'Reilly factor? Is that the, oh, the O'Reilly show? Yeah. No, it's definitely nothing like the O'Reilly factor, I promise you. Uh, the gamma factor is just this. It's the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. That's just a gamma. So, 
Like, for example, when you're calculating relativistic mass increase, what you're going to do is you're going to divide the rest mass by that factor. So let's take something, let's take something, I mean, far, 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 far faster than anything we could ever produce. Let's say that we could, we could launch an object at a speed of, oh, so it's moving at, let's say, about 1,900 miles every second. That's, can you imagine that? 1,900 miles a second, so it would take you like two seconds to cross the United States. That's pretty fast, right? Okay, that's only 1% of the speed of light, right? Wow. And so if we wanted to see how much that's going to increase the mass, let's just do a little calculation. Let's say that our rest mass was, uh, so it's m naught. Our rest mass is 1,000 kilograms. Let's see how much that changes relativistically. So our relativistic mass would then be 1,000 divided by the square root of 1 minus the quantity, 1 minus the quantity 0 0.01 c, 1% 1 the speed of light, right, divided by c squared because it's v squared over c squared, right? Yep. Everybody see that? So the c's would cancel, and what we really get here is 1,000 divided by the square root of 1 minus 0 0.01 squared. Okay, that's not very big. No. I'll prove it to you. That's not a very big change. So 1,000 divided by the quantity 1 minus, oops, I forgot the square root, you're right. Square root of 1 minus 0 0.01 squared. So we would increase our mass by 50 grams. Oh, that's not much. That's not much at all. By five hundredths of one kilogram, if we went that fast. That's unattainably fast for us right now. I mean, think about that. That's really moving. So right? it doesn't change your mass that much. It, would it doesn't. It doesn't. But if we could go, what if we could go 99% of the speed? Yeah. Let's, let's calculate that one. If we could go 99% the speed of light, okay, now all of a sudden we've increased our mass by more than a factor of seven. Nine. Okay, that's a lot. And so what you find then is this calculation that we did. Where's my calculation? I think it must be on this last page. Right down here, this guy, right? So at small speeds, this is close to zero, right? But at really, really large speeds, very, very close to the speed of light, oops. really, really large speeds, what do you think happens? At really, really large speeds, it becomes very, very hard to accelerate something, right? The change in velocity becomes negligible. There's not much of a change in velocity between 0.99% the speed of light and 99.1% the speed of light, right? There's not much change there in terms of the actual acceleration, but the mass is going to start to change dramatically. So after a while, when you get close to relativistic speeds, this term becomes negligible, and most of the force is now consumed by just increasing the mass of the object. Weird, huh? Isn't that bizarre? Right? That's, you know, like I say, that's not, 
that's to us that's very weird physics because that is outside of the realm of our experience right we would never ever experience that kind of those kinds of velocities but if you study physics on different scales that becomes a real issue like if you're studying physics on a very large scale you're studying the physics of cosmology well lots of things in cosmology happen at relativistic speeds you look at the matter that's ejected from the axial or uh, along the polar axes from the a, a, a black hole at the center of a galaxy and it's at relativistic speeds. You look at matter that's being expelled from a supernova, it's at relativistic speeds. There are very many things like there are like medium speeds. Well, what's a medium speed? Uh, like halfway between. Well, yeah, a lot of that stuff would. I mean, you know, like for example, you could look at that, that matter that's, that's, be, that's flying away from a supernova that might be traveling at 0.5c. Yeah, which is relativistic. Like, I mean, that's. And, just like general circumstances. No, in, in our lives. Like the fastest no. train. No, no, uh, the fastest train. We're not, not even, I mean, not like just like being in life, but somewhere in the universe. Like not like a supernova. Supernova is somewhat rare, like depending on how much it is. Mm -hmm. Choose to look at, but I mean, like that, that's pretty rare. So is there something that there's like at a medium speed, just like? Oh sure. Know? Yeah, there are. There are things. Yeah, there are things that move. I mean, there are any, you know, any percentage of the speed of light, you can find stuff that moves at that rate. You know, I'm sure if you look hard enough. Supernova may be a rare occurrence, but think about it. All the stuff in our solar system, when it does happen, is going to be impacted by it. So it might be a rare event, but it's a meaningful one too, right? So I mean, there, my point is just that if, if you're studying high energy physics, this is what you'd be looking. Right? Because in high energy physics, you're dealing with very, very tiny masses that are moving at relativistic speeds inside of an accelerator. And so, yeah, this stuff, this is the math that would dominate what you did. It's just that if you're, you know, if you're working at, if you're designing an aircraft or a car or something, well, you wouldn't, I mean, why would you consider this stuff? Because it's never going to be an issue, right? There's never going to be a time when you're traveling at relativistic speeds. And so what would you use for your force equation? Well, just damn it. Because that would be fine. But I, I just want you to know that it's not, that's just an approximation. Just because of our slowness, the slowness of our lives, it works. But otherwise, it wouldn't, right? Yeah. Okay. That's probably a good place to end. Okay. So next time we convene, and this will be a little while, because you guys have a few days to work on stuff. But next time we'll, we'll take this concept of momentum and we'll explore what happens in collisions that involve more than one object. What happens to the momentum of all the objects combined? Can you still have the uh, letter of recognition that you did before? I do. Uh, yeah. um, I'm for one of the scholarships uh, for engineering at UC Berkeley, I made two letters of recognition.